do that. And then I'll talk about a little bit of the next steps, which might be a recap, but also if I can, I can't not talk about modeling. So if I could talk about earth system modeling and the challenges I see there, I'll, I'll try to squeeze that in here. Selena said I had a couple hours, is that right, to do this talk? So if I can, I'll... I'm pressing the exact same button you're pressing. What am I doing wrong? Look, there. Click on this first, and now you see if you don't ever click anywhere else. You okay. You guys ever read the, or you ever see that video about the Norwegian monks and about how to open a book and all that stuff? Have you seen that one? If you haven't, Google Norwegian monks opening a book. That's basically, you know, what I'm doing here. Um, and anyway, so status is tops, real quick, right? 2022. You know, we and NOAA, and I'm just talking about fish here, I'm not talking about the protected species, but we could probably do the same thing. So we manage about, you know, 490 stocks. And, you know, we got it down, if you want to just cut to the chase, in terms of overfishing and overfished, we're down to about 7% of overfishing in, in the stocks and maybe about 19% uh, of overfished stocks. Overfish means that, you know, there's few, fewer than there should be. Overfishing means that we might have the wrong number, but we're catching too many of them or, or such. And so that's basically the idea. And that's taken a lot of time and a lot of effort by a lot of people to really bring the status of our stocks to this point where it's actually, I think we can honestly brag about it. And, you know, I joined NOAA 11 years ago, so I can't take credit for any of this stuff. This started, you know, probably 30, 40 years ago under Magnus and Stevens, where a whole lot of things were set up in terms of how do we sample, how do we do assessments, how do we work with councils. And I, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that you know, the way that we in the United States manage our stocks really is an example in terms of how others could do it and, and look at what we do. Um, and so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, if it's, if it's working, then why should we mess with it, right? And so one thing I wanted to kind of lead into this thing is, is the models that have been developed to understand, you know, the population and, the, you know, the populations and the stock assessments and so on don't really include long-term trends. And, then, and I'm going to the, talk about the long-term trends that I think we all know about. So they assume the environment is there, but it's, it's average, right? So there's fluctuations about a mean. And so, you know, yes, environment matters, but, but not to the extent that, that I'll argue that we need to think about it more. And as a matter of fact, you look at the way that some of the laws and things like that are written, and there's probably here people in this room that know a lot more about this than I this, but this term about prevailing environmental conditions appears in a lot of the documents, which means that we kind of assume what these environmental conditions are and they're prevailing, just like the term says. That is all going to be something that we, I think, we need to call into question. There are some things like these management strategy evaluations, the MSEs, that begin to look at what ifs impacts of future trends. And I'll talk a little bit about the ACLIME, the Alaska Climate Integrated Model example a little bit. But it's safe to say, well, not safe to say, it's, it's, we haven't really included, you know, what, what now, if, you know, we refer to as climate and understand what are these going on in some of these assessments, or at least not as, not in the level of detail that, 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 we, that we need to. And so this is a picture you've seen over and over and over again. So we know that, uh, you know, climate change is changing. Our, uh, you know, our climate is changing our oceans rapidly than we ever knew or that we ever thought about. And you think about two things, right? One is sort of the secular changes, the gradual changes. Yeah, you know, from, you can see that, you know, acidification is going up and, or, you know, pH is going down and CO2 is going up, et cetera, et cetera. Temperature is going up. That's one way to look at it. The other way is, you know, what we know now is things like marine heat waves and other events that are happening. So really the question in terms of how we think about climate change is also different in that, yeah, 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 there's, there's secular changes, we know that, but I think more importantly, what we're seeing is that there's, is that we need to know where these things are changing. We need to know when and for how long. I mean, we just had the warm blob, you know, for three years from 2013, 16, but equivalent warm blobs happen all over the place for different, different, um, different durations and different, different, uh, uh, magnitudes. So we need to know how often, how extreme, and for how long. So these things are beginning to change about, you know, how we think about our ocean. And these are just some examples of what, and everybody can come up with their own example of what's different about the ocean that they studied when they were in graduate school, right? None of these things were in our graduate student, you know, books that we studied. As a matter of fact, I remember that when I did, you know, homework in, 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 in graduate school, it was assumed that the ocean was going to take up all the CO2 and there was no problem. 
So that was viewed like the solution to everything. And so we never talk about the downstream impacts of things that now are pretty much you know, in our face kind of thing. And some examples of, of what we've seen, and again, these are just, just things that, that I think are familiar to all, but just to, to say the kind of things that we worry about. One is, uh, this, and, and I'm trying to pick examples of different parts of the United States, uh, and then at the end, I'm gonna end up with, with a wind farm issue here. But you know, uh, you know, climate, an example of climate, uh, Pacific cod and the, and the Bering Sea, um, you know, that pinkish uh, area there is the, the cold pool. In between 2010 and 2018, the cold pool vanished. And those purple dot things are essentially the distribution of Pacific cod. And basically the Pacific cod moved like 800 kilometers in eight years. I mean, this is just a really outstanding in terms of, you know, remarkable thing to see in terms of how do you see the distribution affected, you know, by quota barrier, whatever, however you want to refer to as the cold pool in terms of the distribution. So the one thing is distribution of things. And this is just a physically mediated thing. In the North Atlantic, um, you know, the, the whole issue with the North Atlantic right whales, um, basically they, they used to be in sort of that dark blue area, but, you know, in the past five or so years, you know, they've gone up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We think it has to do with the, you know, shifts in ecosystems, you know, and, and the fact that the Calanus that they feed up on is, you know, mainly found up there and less so in the Gulf of Maine where, where they would normally have their feeding grounds. So there's also changes in ecosystem structure. You know, this is another one, perhaps at an even lower trophic level. This is off, um, you know, the South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, which has to do with the occurrence of red tides. Again, even lower trophic levels, if you will, looking at seeing that, you know, that the red tides affect in particular some of the gag and red groupers uh, and including these and being able to anticipate these, um, you know, would be important in, in terms of how we, how we conduct our assessment and science advice. So if you saw one of these things or you anticipate one of these things, then you would provide some kind of advice on, on how to do that. And the same thing, of course, happens here off the West Coast with the red tides here and, and, and in Alaska and so on. And then the last one is sort of an indirect effect of the climate change part is, of course, you know, the fact that our ocean, talk about the new ocean, is one which is really being affected by these man-made structures, right? Um, you know, this is a picture from um, the, the, the East Coast, but you could probably have one off the West Coast as well, or Gulf of Mexico, seeing where the proposed leases are for the, um, for, for, the, uh, for the wind farms. And there are many of them are in areas that are either fishing grounds or areas where protected species migrate, you know, the North Atlantic right whale and other migrate through. And so how do we sample in these regions is, is not trivial. Um, you know, these are areas that we're not gonna be able to go into, not just fishing boats can't go into it, but we're, unless we think this through and really work in collaboration with our uh, partners in industry, how do we actually sample these things? It might wind up that uh, we might have to come up again with new technologies, whether it's gliders, whether it's, you know, who knows what in terms of being able to sample. But fundamentally we've broken up, we're, we're, we're running the risk of breaking up long time series that we've used to understand how, how our, 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 our populations, how we manage our populations, which like I said, we've, we've done so quite well. So everything is kind of being, you know, uh, shaken up in terms of, um, in terms of what we sample, when we sample, how often we sample, et cetera. So, you know, the, the, to put it all simply, you know, we've gone, we've we gone from a period of stationarity to non-stationarity, right? So this is the last thousand years, okay? Northern hemisphere temperature is the last thousand years. And I think, you know, this is a concept that, that, is, that is understood that because things have been relatively constant, yes, there's fluctuations, but it's about a mean, um, you know, civilization has been able to happen. We know what to plan. We know what kind of food we're gonna have. We know what kind of housing we need to build. We know where we're gonna live because on average things are constant. You know, start the, uh, the, the industrial revolution, of course, you know, then, you know, it's anything but stationary, right? So it's this non-stationarity thing where, where, the, where basically, you know, everything is changing. It's, we no longer have a mean, right? So what we have is this trend um, and also the variances about them, uh, which have to do with, you know, not just, not just the trend, but also the frequency in which they occur, but and also the magnitude of which they occur. So these things are things that we have to begin to take into account Remember the slide three, the three slides earlier that normally was not taken into account because the law or the, the, the you know, the term said prevailing environmental conditions. Well, prevailing environmental conditions don't exist anymore, right? So this is a, a 
potentially pretty different way of interpreting how we provide advice. And this is a nice uh, paper from 2018 um, that appeared in Nature uh, Climate Change uh, that really talks about, you know, kind of summarizes the different things that I talked about, right? There's, there's the secular changes that we talked about, the climate change sort of slowly doing that thing. Then we have the long-term variabilities. It could be the PDOs, the ENSOs. It could be all kinds of things. Then you have the short-term variability, and then you have the sum of the things, right? And I, over here, I put the time series of, of the marine heat waves over the North Pacific since 1982. And you begin to see, you know, things really are changing. Right? Again, this is not new, or particularly not here to you guys, but it's something that as you begin to put all of these things together, if you look at this, this bar over here, you know, between extinction ex extremes and survival extremes, you see that the sum of these, eventually you begin to get into that threshold a little bit more on, on different species. And so you really have to look at all of these components, you know, as you, as you, as you try to see, how am I gonna manage the species and how am I gonna project out? How, what advice am I gonna say in terms of when we might reach these points or not? And I'm not sure if it's a valid example or not, but, you know, the, uh, the, we all know the, the crash of the snow crab um, in, the, um, in the Bering Sea uh, last year. The idea, or, or the, 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 the idea of what's happening with perhaps a double whammy of a number of these series having to do both with temperature changes affecting the metabolism of the organism as well as temperature changes affecting the feeding environment of the organism. So just at the time that they needed the kind of food that they needed, it wasn't there to kind of offset the metabolic costs associated with, with that. So this is perhaps an example of I can, I can hang in there, I can hang in there, and then I can't, right? And, and there's other examples of, of collapses like this that are happening that are gonna be really hard to predict. I mean, this ain't gonna be that easy to do, but it's something that we should keep in mind in terms of how do we do it if we're gonna to have to do this. Um, and so if we wanna summarize it in a way, uh, this is a, a slide uh, based on um, a, work, a work from Eva Plagani, um, and that I think she summarized it really nicely in that, you know, we're, we're at a point where rather than being able to look at, you know, just stability and you know, our assumption of stability is some fluctuation about a mean, we really have to begin to look at, at variability. And so the question is, how do we generate advice for adaptation to variability? So it's a, it's, it's, it's a very different way of thinking in terms of where we were and where we might be going, right? All right, so that's sort of a, a background. Now I'm gonna talk about what Selena really wanted me to talk about, <laughs> which is <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act is an incredible opportunity. I mean, it really, and, and I think you guys, and there's a, there's a, by the way, I left a PowerPoint here. If you guys want it, you're welcome to have a PowerPoint. Everything is referenced if you wish. So there was an announcement of, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, in particular, the aspect having to do with the climate ready fisheries part of it. And it's, and it's, it's a significant amount of, of support, about 350 million bucks, to, to really cover a lot of things. And it's a, it's a four year influx of support. Um, and so I have three things over here, the data acquisition and data modernization part. And these are, you know, the, 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 the amounts of, of support that are available there. And then I'll talk a little bit about the Climate Ecosystems and Fisheries Initiative, CEFI, as, as some people call it. There's other aspects of the climate ready fisheries that I'm not gonna talk about, which involve support for the North Atlantic right whale that I talked about a little bit, the red snapper, there's specific salmon habitat, Arctic facilities. So it's really a, a, something that comes in at a time that's, 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 that's fundamentally important to be able to address some of the questions that we have in front of us. And so what we're looking at is this, this IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, to be able to incorporate climate and ecosystem environmental data. We know we need it to provide real-time advice and long-range long projections to inform and support management decisions. So we're looking at this as a way to pivot, as a way to making this change um, in, in, terms of, in terms of what we need to do. So I think we're gonna start with, with and I'm gonna talk about the, I'm gonna talk, I'm not gonna talk about some of the stuff up there. I'm gonna talk about data acquisition and the, the, the CEFI. And then ultimately I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the management advice that is really the driver of all of this. I mean, all of this, the point of all we're doing is, is to do that. So I think we're uh, you know, at a pivotal point in, in ocean and fishery science. 
Um, I've always liked this quote, you know, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And so we need to have all of these, these you know, we need to collect the data to understand what's going on out there. This, you know, the time that everything is changing, you know, we can't not, not collect the data, whether it's changes in, 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 the, in the hydrography, the circulation or the ecosystem structure and function or man-made structures that are also coming in there. Basically, this is, you know, in some ways adding up to that new, new, new ocean that I'm talking about. And so we, I talked about the climate change and non-stationarity, how we need to rethink how everything is connected. Um, and we also, of course, realize that the more the non-stationarity, you know, the harder it is to predict, you know, future changes. Um, but we got to do it. I mean, there isn't much of a choice in terms of doing it. It's how we do it is perhaps a question. Um, the, the changes that I talked about in traditional and emerging ocean use sectors, offshore wind energy, aquaculture, and so on. And then ultimately, you know, it's the, it's the currency that, that, that we use to be able to justify what, what we need to do. So we need to rethink how we, how we do our data enterprise, if you will. And so um, we, need to, we need for modernization. We, we got to move, I think, I think Rick, you're in this picture somewhere. I, I'm not sure, but I, which one is you? I don't know, but anyway. Um, we, we can't collect data like this anymore. And, and we need more of everything. And you got, I mean, obviously we need more rain. The ocean has always been woefully undersampled, right? But we have to be, you know, we have to know what it is that we need more of. And of course that brings challenges with it. What do you do with all that data, right? I mean, we, we have the opportunity of collecting a lot of data, but what do you do with it is, is another, another thing that, that we need to think about. And, and there are some examples that, that we, have, we have done in terms of perhaps we need to, uh, you know, survey enhancement. This is a, a really nice um, example of something that was done in, in the Southwest Center, um, uh, looking at, um, you know, how do you actually combine um, uh, surveys that have to do with marine mammals with surveys that have to do with, um, you know, in this case, uh, coastal pelagics, right? And normally these things are done separately for some reason, right? One's a prey and predator of the other, but they're collected at different times, which you would say that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So this is something that, you know, how do we evolve our surveys? I think we need to think about how they, how they become, I mean, that's one way of doing an ecosystem approach, right? In terms of looking at how the different components are together, not one year I'm gonna sample whales and next year I'm gonna sample sardines as opposed to sampling them when they're overlap, right? So those are some, th some things. These are not easy to do. And sometimes, um, you know, the way that we, that we are pushed into things um, have to do because, you know, necessity is the mother of invention kind of thing and you have to do this. And COVID was a really, um, you know, the silver lining of COVID is that we had to do that. And, and we had to do that because we, our surveys, our, fishing, our fisheries boats, weren't able to go out and uh, you know as much as we would have liked to have them go out because you know simply it was it was you know the pandemic just held everything back and so we did things like rather than doing a survey in the Bering Sea with 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 our ship the Dyson we actually sent three gliders right to cover not exactly everything you see there's many more lines here than there but it was still something that we were able to do by sending three gliders from Alameda there to collect it was only acoustic data. And in this case, it might work because there aren't that many different kinds of species. So the species complex is not as complex as not, not to be able to unravel what the signal might be. <clears throat> but this allowed us you know, to do, uh, to provide enough data to provide a bridge so that we could provide the assessment of, in this case, Pollock um, you know, for, 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 you know, for the, Alaska, uh, the Fraser Alaska region. There was another example. This is also partnership with industry. So this is partnership with industry, partnership with industry, um, having to do with in, in, in the Hawaiian Islands, <clears throat> sampling for what are called the bottom fish, the bee fish uh, program. And that was working in cooperative research and sending folks out you know, with these cameras. And they were actually able to put the cameras out. And then there was, they were analyzed using machine learning, artificial intelligence and such. And again, this was a successful effort that allowed us to do the assessments of these. Uh, this is work that happened off the West Coast here. Um, and, uh, you know, it had to do with, again, normally the core surveys are much broader than they are, but with a combination of keeping some of the stations in red together with some other data that came together from, say, seabird diet and other things, you can still be able to bring things together in a way that, um, that, that allow you to move forward. 
So I think the, what I'm trying to say here is that there are things that we were forced to jump into to try to do things um, that pushed it beyond the proof of concept thing so that we are actually now being able to be a little bit more, mm, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, cavalier about trying to say, yeah, we can, we can move these forward faster than we thought they were. And this is one of these areas where these new technologies, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, can come in in terms of the kind of cooperation that we can have, um, you know, with with uh, with academia, with private partnerships, and so on. And so we have. I'm not going to spend too much time on this thing, but we have a real challenge uh, that we're working with our partners in in Omeo and such. And part of my visit here is going to go meet with the folks over at Mach P. And that's that there's a real challenge in getting the ships out. And I think you probably, probably all know this. And so, again, at a point in time when we really need to be out there, we're being challenged by things like, you know, the ability to hire crew, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the next 10 years are going to be an enormous challenge for us to sample um, for various reasons. One, as I said, there's a, there's, a, there's a global, if not national, challenge in hiring crew. Uh, we have three ships that are possibly going to hit their end of life service or the service life, sorry. So that means that they're going to go offline potentially. We have five of our ships which are going to go offline for about a year each for what's called a midlife repair. Um, and the replacements aren't going to be here in time for when all of this is happening. So here we are trying to reinvent everything that we do. And we're faced with losing the platforms that we normally use to, to do the sampling. So we got to figure out how to do something different here because we simply will not have the ability to do what we need to do. And some of the advanced tech is not yet operational in our surveys, or maybe it's not ready yet to provide management advice. We need to make sure that we're measuring what we think we're measuring before we can, before our advice is accepted. And that's a totally reasonable thing to do. And then of course, you know, once you have all that data, what do you do with it? So that's the other part. So this is sort of the, the challenge of slide. Um, but you know, in terms of how we go forward, um, you know, we, you know, the slide that you guys all seen out of Ambari, a really nice slide, I think captures it, and it's and it's gone beyond sort of a nice slide on your wall to something that we can and need to do. Right, we have to go and use these innovative technologies, uncrewed systems, omics, optical systems, etc., um, to to go beyond the, the the platforms that we have. You kind of wonder. You know whether the the white ships, as we call them, or these ships, you know, really should be more floating laboratories where there might be, you know, more looking at process studies, while some of the other stuff can be done with some of these advanced technologies. Also, combination with cooperative uh, research with with industry. Um, then again, the data part in terms of modernizing how we how we make this available, not just collect it but disseminate it. The AI machine learning thing, I hope to get talked uh, talk about a little bit more, but, but this is gonna be again, critical for us to be able to, um, uh, you know, to be able to analyze and make sense of all of this data and maybe even use some of this for predictive capabilities as well as developing these analytical and modeling tools that I'll talk about a little bit later in the, in the CFI part. And so if you're a graduate student, I mean, take your pick. Any of these things is something that, that you could do. And any of these things is think, this is really the time to be a graduate student. If I could go back, I, I would, but I don't think I could take these GREs again. Um, but it, it's, there's really a lot of things that are out there that are completely different from the way that we did things. We really need to rethink how, how we approach things. And I'm not just saying it, I'm, I'm, I'm serious. It's, it's, this is the part that keeps me awake. And, you know, puts that extra kick in my step in the morning. So we have to modernize. We have to build the additional capacity and we have to strengthen what we do and we have to advance our workforce. Okay, I think I've kind of touched, touched upon that. So within the IRA, going back to that, I mean, that number was about $145 million if we wanted to look at that. There's, there's efforts in there in maintaining the data collection that we have while we develop the other stuff. And also, how do we modernize the data systems that we have? So we we can't just knife edge what we're doing now. We have to continue what we're doing and gradually ramp up into where we need to go. So so I'll talk. I'd glad to talk more about how 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 we hope to do that. Um, let me just jump into the uh, the next part, which has to do with the modeling. And this is a 
I, I promised that there would be a Blues Brothers quote in here. And, and so this is, this is coming in here. So the Climate Ecosystems and Fisheries Initiative in some ways, for those of you who might remember Globec, is like we're putting the band back together again. I mean, this is, Globec was the Global Ocean Ecosystem Dynamics Program. Um, it lasted through about 2005 or something like that. It was a joint NSF NOAA program that looked at the effect of physics on fish, basically. It's, that's, that's kind of what it was. And that's kind of where we, and it ended too soon in the sense that first, maybe we were asking questions too early um, because you know we didn't see the changes. So when we talked to, to, to our colleagues and then I was in academia, I wasn't in fisheries. So when we talked to our colleagues in fisheries, it's like, well, that's, that's kind of nice to know. You know, it's kind of nice to know that climate change is doing something to, to the environment and, and to the fish, but it wasn't the need to know category, right? Well, I think that whatever, 15 years later, now we're in the need to know. We need to change the way that we do our assessments. And so we need to bring back, you know, the ideas that perhaps started there and looking at how the climate variability and climate change is impacting our living marine resources. And this is the part about saying it's no longer, hey, is it kind of cool that something's going on, but how do I actually use it? And the other part is that we, I'm gonna argue that we've, that we've made the advances in our predictive capabilities to be able to start doing them. So, and this happens a lot in our science and many sciences, right? I mean, if you look at what Fjord in 1890 did or something like that, you know, he knew that oceanography impacted the, you know, the recruitment of fish, but, the oceanography wasn't there yet. We were thinking about square boxes with flat bottom oceans and things like that. And that's kind of the same thing here too. So I think that the CEFI is sort of that next step in terms of how do we look at the effect of physics on fish in a way that we can take it all the way to science uh, advice to management. And so getting back to this wiggly line picture, if we accept that, there are no, there's no, there's no longer a mean. There is no longer fluctuations about a mean, but we're looking at trends. We start, we then need to start thinking about providing advice, not just from year to year, but what's going to happen, let's say, in the next ten years, right? And you know, an example could be, you know, I want to develop, um, you know, a seafood processing plant somewhere. Uh, well, is that fish that I'm developing the seafood processing plant for is a pollock or is it tuna? Which is going to be there, right? And that's a huge investment because if you're going to invest in something like that, the first 10 years, you might be at a loss. It's not going to be after 10 years that you begin to break even and then eventually you might make profit. But in 10 years, you might get a totally different system out there. So we need to start thinking about how do, how do we make these predictions in a way that's relevant to the communities that depend on it. You know, the, the socioeconomic part of what we're looking and what we're doing is, is horribly important. Um, and so, you know, this is a, a nice picture from Tomasi and others. Um, where you have the, you know, it kind of puts together, you know, the different physical systems and the little gray clouds, and also the various areas where, um, you know, where what, what part of fisheries is important on a yearly time scale. You might need to do annual annual catch limits. And if you go a little bit longer, you need to think about rebuilding plants, our long term industry capitalization, which is what I just talked about in a second, and the longer term, you know, in terms of looking at overall resilience and stability. And aquaculture is, you know, is probably somewhere in here as well as, as another component. But here's the catch. I mean, there's a catch here, which is, okay, um, if you look at the ability of looking at projections on days to, days to weeks, subseasonal to seasonal as months to years, or interannual to decadal, this is kind of modified from, a, from something in, in, in the weather forecast system. We know that we're pretty good um, you know, on, on sort of the weekly time scale forecast, but there's a pretty steep drop off. Seasonal to subseasonal, you know, if you looked at our ability to forecast, it's not that good. And the reason is it's neither an initial condition nor a boundary condition. It's somewhere in between. And so there's a lot of internal dynamics, internal nonlinearities that drive system to make it really hard. Interannual to decadal is kind of more of a boundary condition problem, you know. I know I'm putting so much CO2 in the ocean, I mean, in the atmosphere, I know what the you know, radiation cycle is and I kind of know what's gonna happen. So we need to make progress in, in how we actually bridge these and, and be able to go from, from what we do perhaps on a shorter time scale to a longer time scale, which is again, one of a challenge. Another reason to go back to graduate school is how to figure out how to do the subseasonal to seasonal to decadal uh, timescales. In some ways that's from our standpoint, from fisheries, 
that's kind of where the ball of wax is in terms of being able to predict those time scales. And then the challenge is that it's not just the ocean that you're looking at because, and this is where you have to look at earth system modeling and in, 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 in integrated, right? So this is um, the globe and you can kind of see the continents and the red is um, where the predictions of chlorophyll three months ahead are good. The redder the color, the better the prediction, three months ahead, just three. I'm not talking about subseasonal to seasonal, I'm just talking about three months out. You know, the equator, we got it nailed. We got the equatorial waveguide. That's kind of a, thank God we have the equatorial waveguide. We kind of know how to do that. And so our predictions three months out are pretty good. What I would focus on is say the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, and it's red, but you can even see that there's a difference in the color of red. And so the Atlantic is much darker red. So for some reason we do better in the Atlantic than we do in the Pacific and the North Pacific. And one aspect is potentially the effect of Asian dust providing nutrients to the North Pacific and the chlorophyll, the primary production part, which immediately says, I can't just look at the ocean. I got to look at what's happening on land as well. So you, you have to be in the couple all the different parts of the earth system. You can't just model the ocean. You have to actually look at what's happening on land. You have to look at what's happening on ice on these longer time scales. I could probably do it on a week time scale, but on a three month time scale, you run into problems because you're missing information from elsewhere. So this is the whole idea of how do we, of needing to bring in full in earth system models to, to look at this. And so the CFI, again, you know, bring back the band uh, on, on Globec, is hoping to look at that where we're trying to build, again, this is something that's hopefully gonna get out of the gate and I'll show an example, a really nice example from the Alaska uh, Climate Integrated Program that, that, that is looking to build end-to-end -end operational systems that, uh, you know, provide, you know, the forecast risk management, et cetera, and hopes to provide uh, these climate informed um, LMR management um, information. And so we see there's going to be like three parts to this. One is getting the data. That data is just personal opinion, high resolution models. Then, you know, then there's, then the data and the models give you something that you then begin to look at. How do you translate that into, into assessments and, and looking at the different aspects of how the ecosystem changes. And then you go back to the management and say, here's the information I'm giving you. And they'll either like it or they'll say, mm, you know, something is missing and it goes back. This is the whole point of this double Mobius strip, if you will, where you begin to look at, you know, how does, how does, this, how does this go back and forth? It's, it's, it's the same idea as a management strategy evaluation um, and because that, that integration with the stakeholders and everything has to be there. So the example of the A-Climb, uh, and I think it, this has been around for a while and it's really a remarkably good example is, is kind of what, what, what it is, uh, what I've said here is one, you start with global models. So you start actually doing the whole earth system for the reasons I said on long time scales, you can't decouple the various components of the earth system. You might begin to downscale some of these, you know, look at five year chunks uh, somewhere. Then you have to couple these to, um, you know, a whole different way of realization of, of complexity of, of, of your ecosystem. It can be very simple or it can be more complex. It, it can include, you know, fleet dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. This is the management strategy evaluation where you just kind of iterate on this thing and boom, magically out pops the scenario. And so you begin to say, this is, this is the difference about, we used to talk about one line. Well, now we have to think about what, what ifs. Because these what ifs, particularly on longer time scales, also depend on the decisions that we make. And so it's not a predetermined output. It depends on what we decide we're going to do. And so how do we communicate this scenario, this, this, the, the analysis of scenarios to the managers who are receiving the system? And do we do it in a way that's, um, that's, that's, that's actionable is part of the conversation. So these, the CFI and other things have integrated in them that conversation with the management side of things so that we, we, um, we actually have, you know, so we don't just say here, here, here's what we think is gonna happen and it becomes meaningless. It has to be something that can be interactive. And so what we're gonna do is uh, initially we're gonna have, um, we're gonna have three grids. There's the West Coast, the Alaska grid, there's the Arctic, and then there's the East Coast. 
working on the Pacific Islands and, and, and others. And, and we're gonna be performing these analyses on these per region, if you will, so Northwest Center, Southwest Center, Alaska Center, et cetera, you know, to try to provide the information that comes out of here with the various components um, uh, that, that are particular to regions because climate impacts in Alaska are clearly different from climate impacts in the Southeast. As I said, you know, one is, you know, a shift in, 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 in ecosystem structure, perhaps, you know, the red tide thing, and the other one might be something else. So I think we need to understand that this ain't gonna be one answer fits all, but there is, there is a common trunk, uh, you know, from which, we're, from which we start. Um, let me skip that, because that's basically what I said already. So I wanna go to the, the, science, the, the science advice part. And this is a, a really nice document uh, that, that resulted from a meeting of the, I'm not gonna say it wrong, the Scientific Coordination Subcommittee, the SCS of the Fishery Management Council's plural. Um, it met last year in August, and this is the, these are the decision makers, right? Okay, what do we need to go, to, you know, what do we need to do to, to, to do forward or to go forward? And the, the, the focus of this meeting had to do with adapting fisheries to management in a changing climate ecosystem. And again, the reference is up there. And again, this, the talk is here. So you guys, you know, don't, don't need to write the references. You're happy, happy to, for you to take the talk. And the key findings of what, not the scientists saying what they need, but these are the managers saying what they need, is saying, okay, we need to have this increased complexity and demand, understand that, that it's gonna be increasingly complex in management decisions. We need to develop the new data collection analysis tools. You know, the councils and, uh, and the SSC, the scientific steering committees uh, need, or sorry, statistical and scientific committees uh, need to be prepared to transition to more sophisticated approaches as well as that stakeholder. And, you know, these are the four main conclusions that came out of there. And then there's subcomponents of these things. You know, how do you include non-stationary? Forget prevailing conditions, which is what I told you, or at least you know, keep them in mind, but do realize that they're being modified. You know, ecosystem linkages, which really, again, under flat conditions, you may not, may not have put it in the forefront of your mind. Prepare to transition from just simple indicators to dynamic simulations, right? From indicators to dynamics and begin the scenario planning, which is like the what if part of things. And so in some the uh, the CFI, I just did it in a cartoon thing. You know, it's not stationarity. We need to know. We need to evolve our advice, and you know, do that uh, there at the end. Tricky part comes in then in terms of then how do you provide the advice? Because there's two scales on the advice. One, I still need to tell people what's going to happen next year, but I also need to start thinking about what happens on the longer run. So in the in the next year thing or in the future years, I can say, well, here's a range of possible scenarios, and you can imagine like the IPCC does most likely, least likely, unlikely, but at least you'll have something uh, that, that, you can, that you can begin to make decisions on. Another one is, um, I've used the term shadow assessments. Um, some people don't like it. I'm very biased because I, 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 I kind of like the term. But anyway, the idea is to do the assessments the way you normally do them, but also do the assessments with the, all this additional information. And until you get it right, or until you figure out how you figure out that you got it right, you perhaps just say, well, you know, the, the, do, the, do, the, the normal way gave me the little black circle. The other way would give me the X. And you begin to see in some cases, well, maybe they line up pretty well. In other cases, there's quite a bit of difference. But I think this is a dialogue that has to happen and we have to build a trust in the science and the technology and the way that we communicate it. And I think this is part of the process of how do we how do we make that link to science, to science advice, right? How do we move, how do we move forward to, to advice to management in a way that is actionable and useful and not just a one-way conversation? So my concluding remarks are basically what I started off with, right? Um, and so it, it, it's back to the future in some ways, but it's also pivoting to a completely different situation, what we're doing. We, we, our, our new ocean, again, is, has required to a need to know on a number of things. And there are these promising and capabilities and opportunities through IRA for these data acquisition, predictive capabilities and provision of science. And the next five years, 
I really believe this. I mean, do offer us a way to pivot to the future. And I actually looked the word pivoting up in the dictionary to make sure I was using it right. And it's completely changing the way in which one does something. And I'm careful about this because you can't, I just said, you know, particularly when you're providing advice, you can't just drop everything and just go to something else. You have to make sure that, 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 that it's the right answer. How do you figure out it's right? Uh, that it's, that it's um, you know, that it goes through all the appropriate reviews and all of that. But I don't think we have a choice. I mean, I think that the things that we have in front of us really don't give us much of a choice in terms of how we need to think differently about how we go forward. And I'm not gonna talk about the last three sl slides, which were the really the good ones about earth system modeling. <laughs> You want it? Yes. By popular demand. Okay. <laughs> I'll try to do it real quick. Okay. Um, and aside on full ESM or system models, if there's time. So here's the thing, you know, and I myself, I, I, this is what I did forever, right? And in terms of modeling, and he always thought that the answer was going to be a bigger model, a faster model, more initial conditions and better parameterization. That's it. All you have to do is wait another two years and you'll have more CPU power and you can do it. Well, how many atmospheric rivers do we have here last year or this year? We had 30. You really think more computer power would have given us this answer? I don't think so. How many, well, what do we think, you know, we would have been able to predict some of the crashes that we saw in, in our populations? I don't think the answer is a bigger computer, a faster computer with more initial conditions and better parameterization. So I think that we need to think differently again about other approaches like AI and machine learning. We need to have this balance between the data that we collect that I just talked about. We're going to be collecting massive amounts of data. What do we do with it together with you know, the approaches that we've taken so far? So it's this balance between data-driven science, which is the way that we I think we will be going, and hypothesis-driven science, which is the way we kind of grew up, right? We always said that we have to explain to you everything, right? But I think this gives us potentially an opportunity to say, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen on Tuesday, I'm gonna predict it, and I'm gonna explain it to you on Thursday. And that might be a reasonable trail. I know there's a the guy in Popeye, Wimpy in the hamburger, there's something about the Tuesday, give me the money I today. For, Tuesday for yeah, something like that, yeah. And so I think this is this goes again into we're dating ourselves here, aren't we? It's like, yeah, okay. Um, this goes a little bit into the, the evolving ways of, of, of science. I mean, this is, to me, this is a pretty fundamental and, and it, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard, right? I mean, I, I always grew up knowing, thinking that I had to be able to explain everything, but I think that the systems are changing in ways that are outpacing our ability to explain them at least the way that we're thinking about doing it. So I, I think this is an important part. And I, there's a really nice paper and I, I'm not gonna go through it, I'm, I'm gonna, I, but I have the reference in here. Um, so it's, it, and again, do take the presentation. Anyway, it's just the digital revolution of earth system science. It's the title of the paper. I really enjoyed reading it. And it really talks about how we need to evolve at a number of levels. Uh, you know, first, you know, they asked the question, can we continue at this pace? And I just said, my point is, Changes in the environment are happening a lot faster than, than our compute power is changing. And we're also reaching the limit of all of these Denard and Moore uh, laws. You know, we're bumping against them, that they're just not gonna be faster than, than what they are right now. It talks about, you know, how do we need to rethink, how do we do our large legacy codes, which is the way that, again, we wrote programs, which is, you know, we wrote a program and, you know, we wrote it in Fortran of all things. And then you know we gave it to somebody who tried to optimize it. Well, I that they argue that that's no longer the case. You need to, when you build your teams. So going back to the CFI and all of that, when you build your teams of people who are doing the modeling and all of that, you need people who can actually talk about questions about not double precision, but what happens if you want to go reduce precision. You know, how do you port compute intensive codes to novel architectures? you know, how to use GPUs, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things are there that we need to begin to think differently in terms of how we integrate our sciences. Um, and so then these new data-driven methodologies like machine learning come in and they offer, they close with the example of, of, um, of digital twins. And I think you guys have probably all heard about digital twins and I'm, I'm on the fence about it. 
but the point about digital twins is really is this combination of the digital replica of a real-time observing system and the physical system. And so, you know, there's difference in terms of how you build something for a short-term weather forecast than you do for a long-term weather forecast or long-term climate forecast. Conservation matters in climate properties or in climate models. Conservation doesn't matter as much when you're doing a weather forecast. But if you start combining the two because you need to, then you run into some problems. And that's where the idea of a digital twin might actually come into play. So there, I covered it. I covered it really fast. I really recommend you read this paper if, if you have, maybe you already have. Um, but anyway, it's a real nice paper. So with that, I'll stop. I think I went a little bit long, um, but it's, it's, I haven't been here in three years. So I'm trying to make up for all the time that I haven't talked to you guys. So thank you. All right, well, let's have a little conversation here. And folks online, if you want to um, go ahead and type in your questions, I can read them aloud, uh, or we might be able to hear you. We'll find out. And you can raise your hand. Yes, go ahead. What's the time scale? The time scale for the funding? Is it one off? Is that sort of over 10 years that it can be repeated? Yeah. Numbers look great, but some context. Right. I'll, so repeat, question, I'll repeat, I'll repeat, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, the question is what's the time scale for the funding? So it's four years. Um, and so that that's a real, that's we know that it's four years. So we, you know, the approach is to make sure that we can make progress on those four years in those areas that we need to. But I think what we need to also do is communicate the successes of what we are, hopefully the successes of what we're doing so that this becomes an indispensable. So it doesn't, so that we don't think of the IRA as a spike, but we think of it as a reset in some ways to, to, to where we need to be and what we need to have in order to go forward. So that's very much in our minds because four years ago is gonna go by real, real fast. And, and, and a lot of the things aren't gonna work straight out of the box, right? I mean, we, things are hard, this is a complicated science. And so four years, but we very much have in mind, how do we make sure that, that that we present this as a reset and not as a one-time spike. Great question. I'm, I'm glad that you had the time to squeeze in the Earth System model slides because sitting in the room with the modelers, uh -huh. um, they do oh, want- let's, let's take derivatives. Yeah, uh, they let's do want more data, right? Yeah, yeah. Standardized data, and we do have some data that we have, but that's not necessarily publicly available. Is there thoughts of having a data audit to make sure that what we have in our archives is available to the public mm. or at least to the modeling community? Yeah. And and maybe providing funded position to help the observationalists make their data publicly available in the standards that the Earth System Modeling community yeah. and, and That's the, a gap, right? The now. simple answer is yes. And, and and the and is it's taken an agonizingly long time to do this. It's self-evident. I mean, everything is said is self-evident. This is what should be happening. There are cases when there's proprietary data and things like that, that also could be handled in, in, in a different way, but there's no reason not to have all of this out there. And we can't, and that's part of the, so in, in, the, in the IRA, there's a data modernization part and management. That, that part is, you know, to solve this problem is gonna require so much data that we can't just, it's not just our data, it's everybody else's data and how it comes together. So that's a, that's a, that's a fundamental part of what we need to do, yeah. Um, thanks, Cisco. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, all the presentation. And one thing is I hear you saying potentially two contradictory things and I really much appreciate both of them. And mm -hmm. I just want to get your response and how you see them together. So on the one hand, it sounds like you said Globec ended too soon and that was a program that really focused on understanding the processes that we need to be able to understand what's happening and predict them. We don't really talk about that as a goal, but that really was the goal. And wrapping up at the end, you're like, well, we don't really care what the processes are as long as we can predict them with these newer models. So I hear you sort of saying both that we need to know the processes and that maybe we don't need to know the processes as long as we can make predictions and appreciate both of those. I'm just curious how you see them fitting together. No, it's a good point. And, and, um, um, the, uh, the, the, that, that's why this is uppercase and, and, and boldface. It has to be both uh, because I think some questions 
weather comes in as an example, right? You know, so when you're working with the folks in the weather service and so on, and a torment tornado is going to hit, they don't want to know why it hit. They want to know when it's going to hit, right? And just tell me when so I can, you know, take all the appropriate measures. And that's, of course, an extreme, you know, okay, that's a different time scale, et cetera. But there are, there are approaches in, in, in machine learning AI that appear to actually accelerate the ability to predict certain phenomena. And, and then you can take, you know, you can take, step, take a step back and, and understand why. So I, I think it's both. I, I honestly think um, in our case, uh, maybe the same thing in terms of, um, you know, it, it, we were in a different time scale. So if you go back to the Alaska crab thing, did people, would it, would it have, you know, it, it's hard, it maybe on those time scales, maybe it's a little bit harder to unravel the, the prediction and the, and the mechanistic part because you, you kind of have time to think about it. But there are other cases where we might be able to, to maybe um, use a little bit of that machine learning part to allow us to maybe look at some predictions and maybe even try to think of the explanation at the same time. So I, I think it's a both, it's an and, it's not an or in my mind. And it's, and it's one that I'm struggling with. Like I say, I, I, uh, I'm very much on one camp, but slowly I'm beginning to, to see, the, to see the, the importance of the and. And, yeah, and I know there's, I'm, there's a lot of biologists in the room. Um, and I'm not one of them. Um, Darwin's finches, was that data driven or was that hypothesis driven? I don't know. I mean, was that something that he looked at the, at the, at the beaks and then said, oh, there's evolution? Or did he say there's evolution and so therefore the beaks will be different? I don't know if that's a totally valid thing, but it's that, that kind of comes to mind. A highly imperfect answer, sorry. Thanks, Cisco, for the presentation and for presenting your, your vision. I'm curious, and maybe this is premature, but how do you envision the actual process of realizing that vision with Inflation Reduction Act funds or otherwise? How do we move forward? Yeah. Um, so all the way from the nitty gritty of honestly writing the position descriptions now that it's been finalized and knowing what, what the final outcome was be. So the position descriptions are going to go out, um, understanding, you know, again, the time scales in which things have to happen, uh, working with, uh, partnerships as well, uh, academia, industry, and so on, because some things we're not going to be able to fill internally in-house, to put it that way. Uh, so I think there's going to be a, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, an all hands call, basically saying, this is what we need to do. And this is, these are the opportunities, whether it's through cooperative institutes, um, whether it's internal hiring, whether it's other things, but it's gonna be um, it, uh, a controlled scramble. Let me just put it that way over the next six months, which is probably what I think it's gonna take to make sure that we have the folks on board. I don't think that we're gonna be able to be fully on board till the end of this calendar. Well, fully on board till next year, but by the end of this calendar year, we hopefully be able to do that. And in part, my coming here and talking to folks is to say, hey, this is coming. So if you were gonna take another six months to graduate, you better hurry up because you know we need, we need people sooner than that. Um, and I'm, I'm partly kidding, I'm partly not. I, we, we need people now, so. I'll just continue on this line of questioning. Um, so a lot here in the band is actually Good. <laughs> and, uh, if that ended soon, what do you think the main challenges are going to be to actually make progress? Yeah, sorry. So the question was that if, if what? Um, so first of all, I'm glad to hear the bands back together. That's very important. Right. Um, and so if you thought the globeck uh, ended too soon, what do you see as the main challenges of actually making progress in the next four years? I think it's been bubbling along because there has been, um, there were programs like FATE, uh, uh, fisheries in the environment that that kind of continued that that then were absorbed by the various centers. So I think every center has that. Our collaboration with the cooperative institutes has that. Um, you know, I'm thinking about folks, whether it's in the Northwest or or in the Alaska Center or in this uh, anywhere. There's always there's there's been that continuing work of of um, you know advancing those ideas that now perhaps are being. No, no longer advanced, but need to need to accelerate to, to translate into actionable advice, actionable advice. And that was the problem with Globek that we stopped short of that. And I think in part because the questions weren't the right ones at that time. You know, we we kind of set it up, but we 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 needed we 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 
it was a question that perhaps was answered or we asked the question a little too early. Um, but I think we, we have the folks. I think, you know, I think the people are there, the people have been working on it. There's been, you know, I've been a couple of conferences lately and I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about this one. What's the guy's Let's name? See. Uh, wait, uh, James Brown, right? I'm, feel, I'm feeling good. It just, it just, just <laughs> came. I wasn't planning on it, but it just kind of popped in there. So, so, so I'm going to take, I have a question online from Yvette Spitz. I'm going to take two more questions and then we're going to break, but we can go and carry on the conversation. Okay. So Yvette, are you there? Can you, can we hear you? Is this Yvette Spitz? I don't know if I can change your, your status here. Yvette? Apparently, we can't let you talk. You know, <laughs> we're trying. Oh, now try. I think we just gave. All you right, now I can. Hi, Cisco. Um, is this a vet? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that. Hey, you got one um, Yeah. I came late, but uh, one thing that I would like to hear um, what you have to say about. So we have the data. We have the model with whatever AI or machine learning, uh, what we call data simulation in the past. But after that, we have terabytes of output. That is not very practical for the pro uh, program manager or for management. How do you see the transition from data modelers to uh, make it available in a format that everybody can grasp uh, very quickly? Yeah, uh, great question and good, good to hear you. I uh, hope I can get to see you before I take off. Um, I'm gonna say something that again, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on thin ice on this one, but the whole idea of open science comes to mind in terms of how to begin to look at that. And I think, um, again, that's part of what we were thinking about under the IRA is, is exactly what you're saying about that you're gonna have all of this data, massive amounts of data, and you don't necessarily want access to all. You want to, how do you, how do you carve out the part that you need in a way that is also part of a broader team looking at it? So I think that, I'm, I'm looking to open science as part of the answer. Of course, you know, we need to make it publicly available and everything. That was the question earlier. Uh, but I think that there's methods again that, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge that 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 we're gonna having all of this, what's that? The, I think I had a picture in here, right? Which, which is, um, our, you know, the, the, the sea of data that, that we have here on the, on the, on the, on the right here and the, all, all of this number here, we have to, we have to be able to, to look at it. And it's new to me. So if somebody over here can tell me whether you think open science is a way forward, let me know. Um, because I think this is something that, that we will have to do and embrace doing differently. So it's, it's, I presume this is large teams coming together, not siloed approaches or anything like that. Um, and, and I think that might be it. That I, that's as far as I can go. I'll be honest with you, but I, I, that's what I'd like to learn about a little bit more. And there's folks in the Northwest Center um, Eli has taken taking some of this on, but again, this is the kind of opportunity that working together with academia, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of how that's happening, we could we could we could see if we could um, you know advance. All right, there's two more. Thank you, Cisco. Appreciated it. Uh, Thank you. Do me a favor though, and replace the word cavalier with the word rigor, and that would that would make me feel a lot. I, I was struggling. A much better word, yeah. And having having, having sat in a lot of business meetings. What I see is a lot of good ideas up there. Kind of a, uh, I don't know, call it, I don't know what to call it. No priority, I guess, that I could see. I mean, there are lots of things you'd like to work on, but no real priorities. And I guess the other thing, because I work here on the Oregon coast and associated with other conservation organizations, we've got a listing right now for uh, Chinook, coastal Chinook, down in California, Oregon, Washington, and we put in a petition, but uh, no fisheries hadn't had a chance to make a decision on whether that petition is worth their time. Mm -hmm. So it's those kind of things that when I look at this presentation, I just think this is going to last for a long time. We're really not going to get any answers. 
when we have on you with, for the things that really interest me and in folks that I work with. Yeah. On, on the on the subject of no priorities, that uh, um, I, I, I'm really not trying to just focus on pop culture answers, but you know the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once, I think is part of where we're going into in terms of the next generation of science and how we do things, and I think that it, it, almost in the way of thinking in terms of explanatory power of hypothesis and experiment, and then you know whatever. I think I think that's that in itself in terms of how we approach things and looking at a multiverse of things if you will is perhaps a different way of thinking about all of this information how do we incorporate it how do we analyze it in ways that I think makes this interesting not just from the fisheries natural science thing but even in the whole concept of the advancement of science in terms of what these next steps of science are going to be perhaps in this how do you how do you do them all at once which which is again contrary a little bit to to what we said because i don't see them separate i i i i you can't do the data without you know wait until all the data is there before you do the, the the modeling before you do the advice i mean it all has to be happening simultaneously so i like i hadn't thought about the fact that there's no priorities but but you're right i i didn't prioritize them i think that they all have to happen at the same time thanks. yeah thanks have one last question. So, Cisco, uh, I really appreciate the concept of the need to know now. Mm -hmm. we've, we've transferred that. And your calling here, and that this whole IRA is really, as you said, it's call, calling for a pivot. Mm -hmm. this, this, I see the science pivoting faster than the ability of management processes to accommodate that. Is there any thought about how to? bridge that uh, or you just I mean as the RA hoping that um, the magic will catch up as quickly as uh, well, that was that was why I put up that um that was uh, you know that that um reference to this uh, I know how to do it. I learned <laughs> um, that one that 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 was to me sort of a an a a, a, a um I, 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 what I'm, I'm looking for words now again. I, I, now um, <laughs> it was it was it was a telling report, you know, that came out when 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 they basically also didn't prioritize. I like I like that comment a lot. You know that they want the complex management, they want data collection, and they want more sophisticated. They wanted more, more, more. It goes back to my picture of that, you know, that boombox with more, more, more dials everywhere. Um, so this is the call from them. I mean, they actually are saying we need this now. I think that the table is set. I mean, maybe I should maybe that's the way to say it. the table is set for us to go in there and, and have that conversation of the science challenges and the management challenges jointly. I think that that we we're, we're there, and I think that if anything, we should probably have more of these meetings jointly in terms of how do we do this again. And the word that I keep using is make it actionable. Right? How is the science actionable? What can they use? You know, from what from what we gave them. But it's no longer the, yeah, that was kind of interesting. You know, the, the first years of the blob, when we did presentation to the council, it was less kind of interesting, you know, but what am I going to do? Now it's there in their top four. So I think I think both of us have evolved. Both communities have evolved. So it's a it's a right moment to do this. Honestly, I think we do have a window that we that we that we have to make good on. Because I also think about this if five years from now we don't do this. They're going to say, "Why didn't you?" So I, I, I think this is a, this is one of these moments. So, and I'll just add, I think there's a real role for social scientists with that question in mind. Um, how do we make this pivot? You know, working with management and and stakeholders. Yeah, so. absolutely. Cisco, thank you so much. I'm not um, done. We could really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to go do, down to uh, beer one. I want to just draw your attention to what I wrote up on the board here. We have a couple of meetings. OSU is doing a research oriented meeting. Uh, the research office uh, will be doing that tomorrow, where people can uh, will actually be presenting some uh, short flash ideas uh, about projects and partnerships uh, for the IRA opportunity. And then we're doing a coastal community focus workshop on the 13th on Thursday 
to get some input from folks uh, up and down the coast here. And so Karina Nielsen, um, maybe what, uh, Karina, maybe you could put the link in, in the chat there and uh, she can send you the link if you haven't received it already. She's been sending out um, these announcements far and wide. So uh, let me know if you need that um, connection as well. Thank you so Thank much. You. And Thank we'll you. continue Appreciate the conversation. Great to Thank see you. you. Thank you.